Hi, this is Larry Bauer, Chief Executive Officer of the Family Medicine Education Consortium, and I have the pleasure today to be talking with Dr. Megan Grega, a family physician who is co-founder and chief medical officer of the Kellen Foundation in Lehigh Valley area of Pennsylvania. Dr. Grega, thanks so much for uh, joining with us today. Thank you, Larry. It's my pleasure. So why don't you give us a little background about yourself? Um, where did you get uh, started? Where are you from? Where did you go to medical school, residency program? How did you choose family medicine? Those kinds of things. Oh, absolutely. Um, believe it or not, I was actually born on a Navy base back during the, the Vietnam War. So I started out in the, in the military. My dad was an officer during that time. And we moved around a lot when I was young. But by the time I got to high school, uh, we came back to the family area, which is the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania. I actually have a, a long extended family here. And then from, from that area, when I went to college, I went to Bucknell University, which is an awesome place to go. I would highly recommend it. And I got a degree in cell biology and biochemistry. And then I went to the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, which, again, was absolutely a phenomenal experience. I had a great time there. And during that time is actually when I started thinking about being a family doctor. When I first uh, decided to become a doctor, I had been doing some cancer research with a professor, Dr. Mitch Chernin at Bucknell, uh, and we were looking at uh, bone cancer. And when I went to Penn, I really thought I was going to be a pediatric oncologist. That was my, my plan. But as I started to learn more about medicine and, and get to see patients, I realized I really wanted to be able to take care of people all the way from birth till, till the end of life and families and get a chance to really know my patients all the way through their life cycle. And so it was at Penn that I decided that I was going to switch into family medicine. And it has been a wonderful, uh, a wonderful decision because at the same time, I decided at Penn that I was going to uh, join the Navy after residency and spend some time as a medical officer. So being a, a family doc is perfect for that type of a career path. And uh, I have had a lot of great experiences with the families of the military as well as now out in the civilian world. So after Penn, I was deferred from the military and I went to Hunterdon Medical Center for my family medicine residency. Uh, Dr. Stan Kozakowski was my residency director and I was really blessed to have him because he was a great mentor all the way through that time. But then after that, I was deployed on active duty and spent several years as a, a military medical officer, um, usually at branch clinics and things like that in the, in the area. But I was on active duty during the time of 9-11 and some of those pieces of our, of our country's history. So I had a chance to uh, not only take care of our forces, but the families and the retirees during that time. And then after a while, I decided it was time to come back to the Lehigh Valley again. It always kind of brings me back. And uh, my family and I moved back to Easton, Pennsylvania. And I've been a family doctor and now a board certified lifestyle medicine doctor in the area since that time. Fantastic. What a journey. Can you tell yes, us about it's been exciting. The, uh, I can tell. Uh, I can tell from uh, the way you're talking. And by the way, Stan Kozakowski is a good buddy. Uh, he's also past uh, president of our organization. So we were together just a few weeks ago and we had a nice chance to uh, uh, spend some time talking. So he's doing, he's alive and well. Yes, I've been very so, happy to know that. <laughs> he's going to be around for a good long time. Yes. So tell us about the Kelly Lynn Foundation. So Kelly Foundation is a 501c3 local nonprofit that uh, my, my business partner, Eric Ruth, and I co-founded really to focus on family and community wellness. So we have four main pillars. We didn't start out with four. We started in, in one at a time, but we have now grown into having four main pillars that kind of all wrap together into this strategy that we call the Healthy Neighborhood Immersion Strategy. So pillar number one is really Kellen Health, and that has to do with interventions for families and individuals that are struggling with either risk factors for chronic disease, already having chronic disease, lifestyle choices that, that are putting them at risk for um, not being able to live the best life that they can. So those are intervention programs and then we also have, as a piece of that, uh, as a piece of Kellen Health, 
continuing medical education opportunities for medical students, for residents, uh, for, for practicing clinicians, nurses, dietitians. And we most recently actually hosted the inaugural Lehigh Valley Lifestyle Medicine Symposium just a couple weeks ago that was really focused on for all of us, how can we make the lifestyle choices and how can we help our patients make the lifestyle choices that are going to lead to the most uh, longevity, vitality, and, and decreased risk of chronic disease. In addition to all of that with Kellen Health, we really mentor a lot of medical students, college students, residents, as far as being out in the community and how can you make an impact in people's lives, not just in your office, but also out where they, the patients, are living and working and playing. So Kellen Health is pillar number one. Pillar number two is Kellen Schools. And that was the second pillar that we started up. And uh, one of the reasons that we got into Kellen School Programs was because when we were doing the intervention programs with families, they were doing really well as far as their, high, their healthy lifestyle choices when they were with us. But then once they left the intervention and kind of went back out into the what I call the obesogenic environment, they were having a hard time. You know, the social norms were not uh, kind of aligned with the type of choices that they wanted to make. So I was the doctor on the Eastern Area School District Wellness Council, which I still am, but this was probably about 10 years ago. And I said, why don't we go into the schools and try doing this in, try to do some education in the schools and see if we can kind of shift the culture to make what we always like to say, the healthy choice, the easy choice. So luckily, with me being the doc on the Wellness Council, they said, sure, go ahead. Why don't you do that? So Kellen Foundation developed a uh, kind of consecutive curriculum for third, fourth, and fifth graders that are in classroom presentations that are very interactive, very hands-on, and we teach the kids very practical skills. So we'll go in and in third grade, our presentations are called Eat Real Food. And it's all about eating fresh fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, uh, and kind of what counts as a real food. So unprocessed foods as much as possible. We play detective games and talk about being a food detective and pick, okay, if I have here a picture of oatmeal with some strawberries and blueberries on it, and then over here I have a bowl of a sugary breakfast cereal that's fluorescent colors, which one counts as your real food? And the kids vote and we do all sorts of fun games. But then at the end, we also have a healthy snack together. And it's usually something that either has grown in their own school garden, which we'll talk a little bit about the garden as a classroom program, or something from a local farm. So we, we tie in the, the local farm community as part of it as well. In third grade, that uh, type of programming goes into the science standards in our area. And if you're gonna go into doing school programming with, with kids, it's very helpful to tie it into the standards that the schools are already looking to teach so that they uh, kind of are able to give you the time that you need to come in and talk with the kids. So that's third grade. And then in fourth grade, we do healthy choices, which is all about the red, yellow, green label reading system. So we, we teach them about nutrition labels and percent of calories from sugar, um, how grams of fat per serving, and then talk about where does it fall. If something like a food comes in a box or a bag, how do you decide whether it's healthy for you and how can you interpret the nutrition label? We also go through a lot of other things in, in fourth grade that are healthy lifestyle choices, like how much exercise and screen time and, and sleep and things like that for the, the kids to think about what sort of choices are they making and what are they building their body out of. And uh, that goes into that, that type of programming goes into the math standards for here in Pennsylvania. And then in fifth grade, we do eating out survival skills. So kids are getting old enough that they're going to parties and hanging out with their friends, maybe going out to some of the, the restaurants in the area. So we go on a virtual tour through a lot of restaurants, a lot of different uh, fast food and, and other organizations, and then talk about here's some choices, you know, because we all want to go out and have a good time with our friends. But when you go to these restaurants, what are some of your healthy options and how, how can you determine that? And that kind of wraps around the whole curriculum of healthy food, healthy exercise, healthy sleep, uh, social connections, decreasing your screen time. And that really the choice is up to you. Like we talk to the kids about, you know, whose job is it for you to be healthy when you grow up? And they'll raise their hands and some of them will say, my doctor, or some of them will say, my parents. But we usually get to the point where somebody raises their hand and says, 
no, it, it's ours. It's my, it's my responsibility. And that's the point that we want them to get at a very early age while they're still making their habits, while all those things are still forming, is that it's really the power's in their hands as to whether they're going to grow up and be able to live a healthy lifestyle and, you know, only come and see people like us as doctors for their preventive care or whether they are going to unfortunately uh, live the standard American lifestyle. And if you live the standard American lifestyle, you are most likely going to end up with the standard American diseases. So the school programs we think are some of the most effective ways to, to help with the, the healthcare really, or the health of the future. And one of our favorite pieces of that then is the garden as a classroom program, which is school gardens that the kids work with us in to plant their own food and, and harvest and, and actually get to savor and taste these vegetables that they're growing in their own school garden, which has been a great way to help them sort of shift their taste buds to trying more fruits and vegetables. So at this point now, Kellen has, uh, with the school programs, we're now in nine different school districts here in the Lehigh Valley. We uh, service 39 different elementary schools and reach over 9,500 kids per year in the Kellen school program. So that's one of our, our biggest impact and outreach sort of pillars. Okay, we got pillar one was Kellen Health, pillar two is Kellen Schools, and then pillar three is Kellen Kitchens. And Kellen Kitchens is going out into the community, places like after school programs, senior centers, YMCAs, uh, summer programs for kids. And we do six to eight week cooking series where we do the cooking with the participants. So it's not just a cooking demonstration. They come up and actually do kind of like what we now are talking about as culinary medicine in the medical world. But we've been doing this probably for about 10 years now where we just go out with people and cook and we talk about healthy food and cooking season of, uh, in season. We use plant-based uh, ingredients as much as possible. And then we all sit together and eat the food and have conversation. And it ends up being a, a social thing as well as an educational and a, and a nutritional thing. And we give people the recipes in English and Spanish. And then we go back and see them next week and see what did they try in their own kitchen. And they, they really start to form a group. Usually it's kids and their parents, or sometimes it's grandparents, sometimes it's whole families, but they really start to form a support group in eating healthier because they're, they're all doing it together. So that's been another very effective intervention. Um, I think we as doctors so often tell people to eat healthy, but we don't really do it with them and we don't really explain it in a way or help them experience it in a way that they can actually integrate it into their lives. And then our fourth pillar is Helen food access. And that has to do with taking food into areas of food insecurity. Because again, if we're telling people we want you to eat more vegetables, but they live in a food insecure area, they may not be able to access that in any, uh, with any regularity at least. So, the Kellen, um, Kellen Food Access involves the Eat Real Food Mobile Market, which is a 24-foot trailer that we bring into 12 different sites in the Lehigh Valley on a weekly basis, providing local fresh produce, fruits and vegetables, also some whole grains and things like that, that people can count on us as their healthy grocery store on wheels, basically right there in their neighborhood. And we accept cash, but we also do credit and debit cards, the EBT SNAP card, and we also accept the FM uh, NP WIC vouchers for seniors and, and for WIC for, for women, infant, and children. So it makes it convenient, makes it affordable. And we kind of, by being there every week, we are creating relationships in these communities. So the mobile market's now in its, uh, actually, we're about to start our fourth season next week. So next week, we're, we're, we'll be doing our, our fourth season. And in the last three years, we've been able to sell about 30 tons of produce in these areas of food insecurity here in the Lehigh Valley. And in so many ways, it's, it's a relationship building thing because we're also doing cooking demonstrations on the market. We're also sampling, we're giving out recipes, we're taught we're doing a, a healthcare screenings. So it's like taking the, the experience of, of the healthcare system of doctors, hospitals, that kind of thing out into the community and putting it down in a place that's more accessible for people to reach. And then the last part of our Kellen Food Access is the Lehigh Valley Community um, Healthy Corner Store Initiative. And what that is, is actually bringing produce into corner stores in these areas that the mobile market visits and the elementary schools that we visit. So the neighborhoods that we are spending our, our, the majority of our time in, we also are able to supply the corner stores with healthy food, like 
fruits and vegetables from our local farmers. And by doing that, we're helping to get rid of the definition of a food desert. So there you go. That's Kellen Foundation. <laughs> wow, that is just fantastic. Just fantastic. So this sounds like uh, it needs some uh, significant funding. Where, where does your financial support come from? Oh, that's an excellent question. So Kellen Foundation has just finished our 12th year. And so we did not start out anywhere near to the size that we are now. So when we first started with the intervention program, really my co-founder and I self-funded it so that we were able to kind of prove the concept and, and build it the way that we thought it would be most effective. But by doing that, we also made a lot of connections throughout the Lehigh Valley with different you know, funding organizations and with individuals and hospitals. And um, as we expanded out, we've put together a very, I guess, eclectic is a good way to put it, mix of, of funding. So some of it is fundraising that we do ourselves and donations. Some of it are it comes from grants. Some comes from um, corporate sponsorships of individual schools. So say you have a car dealership and you have grandkids in one of these elementary schools, maybe that's a great way for you to um, do some marketing and sponsoring of the school by, by doing the Kellen School Program. And we also provide some of our, uh, our funding by the activities that we do. So for example, we have the mobile market and we sell the produce. So we don't just give it away, we sell it, but we sell it at very competitive grocery store prices. And we're actually bringing in local produce, which is a little bit harder for people to find in those, in those areas. So the cost of the food helps cover the, the, buy, the purchasing of the food. It's more that you have to figure out the overhead cost of your staff and the market right. and, the, and the cooler. So in the way we've been able to do that is by having places like the United Way, for example, or um, we have a wonderful foundation here in the Lehigh Valley called Two Rivers Health and Wellness Foundation. And they've uh, helped by doing catalyst funding for the mobile market. Uh, Rotary clubs have helped. The Eastern Rotary Club really helped purchase the trailer that we take out into the into the areas. So it's like reaching out to lots and lots and lots of different stakeholders and showing the strategy of this healthy neighborhood immersion. And healthy neighborhood immersion, the, the strategy of it is to say, okay, take an elementary school catchment area, take a neighborhood, and focus a lot of resources for healthy living into that neighborhood. So do the, the Kellen School programs and you're reaching the kids and the parents and the PTAs and the, the staff members. Do the school garden. That's another way that you're really getting people involved in healthy eating and connecting with each other. Do the Kellen Kitchens cooking demonstrations so you're teaching people how to use the food that they're growing in the garden. Do the uh, Eat Real Food mobile market and the healthy corner stores so that the food is available there year round. Do other things that are, are have to do with like exercise, walk with, doing walking, doing um, other activities, and then use the Kellen Health piece of healthcare interventions or screenings like blood pressure screenings or diabetic education, and also interventions for people that are already having chronic disease like diabetes or high blood pressure. Put all of that in one neighborhood, and that shifts the culture of that neighborhood. That's a strategy that has resonated with a lot of the different um, healthcare partners and other nonprofits and foundations in our area to say, okay, we need this infrastructure. Like programs are great, but you want a whole strategy for changing the culture of health in that neighborhood. And the 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 structure that we've put together with the education and the food and the healthcare has been something that has been very well received here in the Lehigh Valley. But it's something that every year we're talking to people about uh, trying to get the funding because. Unfortunately, this is not something that our current healthcare model supports. You know, you can't bill for this. Even if you are doing a cooking demonstration for a diabetic population, unless you're doing it as a shared medical appointment, that's not something that you're going to be able to go through insurance. So you have to be creative and, and look for like-minded people that are trying to help solve these problems. So I'm curious, have you ever thought about how you would measure the impact of this work? Uh-huh, absolutely. So we have things um, in place to measure the impact of the school programs as far as knowledge gain. So we have pre-tests and post-tests. 
and we give the pretest when we're there with the kids before we do the presentation. We do the post test two weeks later so that the teachers are wonderful. They do it, they, they administer it for us, but it's not like we give it right after the presentation. So it gives us a better idea of the knowledge that they retain. And we have some excellent metrics for that, showing that the kids are learning things like making sure that you have at least five servings of fruits and vegetables a day and things about why do you eat the rainbow of colors because of the different nutrients and the different foods as what, what, what would be your healthier option if you are at a party or so they're gaining knowledge. We would love to get to the point where we're actually seeing uh, behavioral change. And we are starting to work on a, a metric of that. And it's something that we call the veggie challenge. So we talk to the kids in schools and say, we all know that, well, we ask them, where do your taste buds live? And they all raise their hand and say, your taste buds live on your tongue. And we say, well, do you, how many of you think that your taste buds can change over time? And you have them vote on it and everything. And then you say, yeah, it turns out that your taste buds can change over time. And that it takes about maybe three months or so for your taste buds to change, maybe less. And science has also showed us that if you don't like a flavor, if it's something new to you that you're just not used to, if you try it 10 to 15 times, you're likely to get used to it. So we are going to challenge you to do a science experiment on your own body. So we, what we want you to do is to take the vegetable that you like the least. And all the kids by this point are like, oh, no. <laughs> We're like, hey, it's a science. It's, it's an experiment. Like, are you up for a challenge or not? This is an experiment. So go home and talk to your parents or your grandparents or whoever cooks with you and say, I am a scientist. I want to try this challenge to see whether I actually can change my taste buds. And the way that I want to do that is by having the vegetable that I like the least once a week for 10 weeks. And we give them science logs and, and we, um, we ask them to write down what they are experiencing. And we're like, you don't have to eat a whole plate of this vegetable you don't like. Just have a couple tastes, you know, get it, get it on your tongue, get it, get a, a sense of it each week. And, and you can cook it different ways. You can roast it. You can, you can saute, you can do all these different things, but write down what you think of the vegetable. And so we say, you know, week one, you might say my, my least favorite vegetable is Brussels sprouts. I had it with my parents steamed it and it was disgusting. I thought I wanted to throw up. We're like, that's fine. Write that on your science log because that's observation. And that's what science is all about is observation but keep trying it. And now week two, you know, write down what you think there. By week four, some of you are going to be saying, all right, I had my Brussels sprouts. Uh, my mom tried roasting them. I ate a couple. It wasn't that bad. They're still not my favorite, but it's not that bad. And then I ask the kids, well, what's happening? What, what's happening to this person? And they say, yeah, their taste buds are changing. I'm like, exactly. And by week 10, I said, but at least it's as far as our pilot studies have shown, about two thirds of you will like the vegetable that you did not like at all in the beginning. And so I want to come back in 10 weeks and find out which of you are those two thirds that actually can change their taste buds. And so we get the kids involved. Now, not everybody's going to do it, but it's a way of getting the kids to kind of take this information home, really actually try a behavioral change strategy, and then be excited, come back and talk about it. We have a little party and people get little prizes for just for participating, not for if your taste buds change, but if you participated and you did the actual science experiment, then, uh, then you get a little prize for that. But it's, it's been a very intriguing and uh, interesting metric to watch because first of all, the kids get excited about it. So now I got kids excited about eating vegetables. <laughs> That's something I think is cool. Then they come back and they want to tell you what the experience was like. So they want to tell you this whole story about how they used to hate tomatoes and now their mom made it this way and now they like it. But it really gets us talking about food and different ways that we can prepare food and different things we can try together. So that's a, a ongoing study that we're doing that we haven't published any metrics on yet. But we, we find that the kids that participate, a lot of them, more than half, their taste buds change and they like the vegetable that they did not like before. What I would love to do is figure out funding to be able to actually bring the food in for the kids so that everybody would have a chance to participate instead of kind of relying on a family to be able to do it. Uh, we're talking about having the kids try it in the cafeteria, but there's only a certain number of vegetables available at different times in the cafeteria. So we'll see how we go with that. So that's, that's school programs. We have um, knowledge gain one. Oh. As far as other metrics, we have the how many um, like pounds of of where, like, how many tons of fruits and vegetables are being sold in the corner stores and in the areas of food insecurity. And then we also have some um, 
metrics about survey results of people saying now that they're eating more servings of fruits and vegetables now that they're coming to the mobile market and using some of the that's specific to the SNAP uh, beneficiaries because there's some serving, surveying instruments we've done with them. But I think some of the best stuff that we get really is anecdotal stuff. You know, patients that are coming to the market and they tell us that, you know, it's, it's, it's their choice to tell us because it's, it's, we're not their doctors, but they tell us about their diabetes or their hypertension. And, and we hear many stories of patients being able to decrease their diabetes medicine or get off their diabetes medicine or decrease their blood pressure because they're coming and eating more fruits and vegetables and using the, the recipes that we're giving. So some interesting inclinations or at least uh, interesting uh, ideas that these are probably making a big difference in patients' lives. So I'm curious, Megan, are, are your um, initiatives connected up to the primary care practices in, in your service area? So we do reach out to the physicians in our service area, and there are some specific clinics like um, that have specific patient populations that are more connected. So we do have a uh, diabetic clinic in one of our areas, one of the, the neighborhoods that we spend a lot of time in, that we have a fruit and vegetable prescription program with. So the diabetes educators give the diabetic patients a certain amount of money that they can bring to the market and it's redeemable on the mobile market because everything there is going to be uh, a healthy choice. And then they kind of go back and talk to the diabetic educator about what food did they get and, and what sort of, what was their experience with it? So that's, a, that is definitely a way we connect in. Um, and that's just one example of a clinic, but it's kind of letting the, the docs know and the other clinicians know that right. we're in the area. And that's something that we've been working on over the past three years and has definitely gotten more integrated now that we're going into our fourth season so that we send out our uh, site schedule list to a lot of the doctor's offices that are nearby where our mobile market sites are. And we also give presentations to the different hospitals and the different service lines in our area to say, hey, we're, we're coming back. And you know, anybody who wants to refer patients to us, this is when we'll be in the area. And this is the the cool. funding, or not the funding, but the, the way that patients can pay so that we're spreading that information. I'm curious, have uh, local media found you yet? We have had people get excited about the mobile market when it first launched. So the first season, we got a lot of coverage of it. Uh, we haven't had as much coverage since then because I think now, you know, hey, it's the third year. Oh, now it's the fourth year. You know, <laughs> still doing the same thing. Yeah. But it, uh, but we have had some coverage of that. We definitely get coverage every time that we start a new school garden because that gets everybody excited with the school garden. But which I think is really awesome. But it's, uh, it's funny because then like when you're when you say, okay, now we're doing the third year of the school garden. Well, that's you know that's not anywhere near as exciting. So we find that media is very happy to come and is is very supportive. Definitely, any time that there's something like new and exciting happening. But in uh, as far as like covering the whole concept of how do you shift a culture, I think that would be a great, a great like study yeah. or, or maybe a great piece for the newspaper, a great thing for the, for the um, TV. But I think media is having a really hard time as well, keeping their kind of like financial heads afloat. And so right. I know a lot of our, our reporters that were following us in the beginning they're not even reporters in our area anymore. So it, it depends on um, what, is it a slow yeah. news day or not? <laughs> gotcha. So Megan, we need to uh, bring things to closure. Are any other points here for any of the listeners who want to follow in your footsteps? Um, any recommendations for them? Oh, yes, absolutely. I would say as a family doc, this is a perfect uh, thing to think about adding into your life, not the whole Kellen program per se, but getting out of the office and being into the community is just so rewarding and really um, kind of makes the, some of the frustrations of medicine that we have with the way uh, some of our requirements are at this point. All of that goes away when you go out into the schools or if you go out into the communities that actually spend time with patients without the electronic medical record between you and without the concerns of like what ICD-9 code do or ICD-10 code do I put with this. So I think it's really helpful for our souls and for our love of medicine 
to get back out into the community. And one of the best ways, I think, to start is in the schools because you could just pick one grade at one school and do something that that you're passionate about, something that you think is exciting, whether it's cooking, whether it's gardening, but to kind of be that that uh, dock out in the community, you really do make a difference if you stick with it over time. If you just go once, everybody will love that. That's great. But if you go every year, you become a part of that community. And they like when they see you come in, they're all excited and your know, kids will run up and give you hugs and Parents will be calling you and saying, what, what salad did you feed my kid? They came home and they said that they want to have salad. Like, what did you do? Right. That sort of stuff is why we went into medicine, I think. And it is definitely, a, I would definitely say that I work even harder now, more hours than when I was just doing primary care. But it's so much more like fulfilling and enjoyable that it, it gives me energy for the other things that I do. So I would highly recommend it. And uh, if anybody would like to get in touch with me, I would be happy to talk about how we built the, the Kellen organization and ways that you might be able to start doing something similar in your community. Thanks very much for that. Uh, we'll make sure that your email address and your website is uh, on the material when we send out this uh, podcast so people can follow. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to uh, actually meeting you on June the 10th. Uh, when I get a chance to come visit uh, the foundation and, and share a dinner with you. So very much uh, looking forward to it. And thank you so much for spending this time with us. Oh, thank you, Larry. I look forward to it too. And I really appreciate having the, the time to have this conversation because I would love to spread the Kellen message and the, the family medicine out in the community message as far and wide as possible. Because I think that really speaks to why we all became family doctors. So thank you for taking the time to chat with me. It's my pleasure. Take care.